The coding durability test puts XS through a cycle of 10,000 strums. Through the lens of a microscope, it is clear that XS retains its composition better than other coded strings. Testing complete. with Premier Guitar. We're at the historic Ryman Auditorium and I'm with Kenny Wayne Shepherd. Kenny Wayne, hey man. What's going on, brother? Good seeing you. Good to see you too. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, it has been a while. <laughs> yeah, and you did a rundown with us, God, a while ago. Yeah, it was like one of the early ones, like yeah. in the very early days. It was actually one of the longest ones I think that's ever, it was like 47 minutes long or something yeah. like that. But we pulled everything out that we had out on the road that right. day, and they left it all in. I figured they would edit it out, <laughs> you know. uh, and condense it. But it's like they pure left gold. The, yeah, it's, yeah, it's all it's all interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. anyways, you know, yeah, it was one of the er I think it was one of the very earliest ones, and you know, now we're having a chance to catch up again. Right. And yeah. this guitar was in that one. Obviously. I think it was. It probably was. Well, it's, yeah. uh, that guitar has been with you like since the beginning. Yeah. Tell mm. me the whole. Uh, in fact, I know. But these people don't, so go ahead and hear the whole story. Right, well, the, actually, this one I picked up after my first album came out. Um, I wish I would have had it for the first album. <laughs> but at that time, I couldn't, I couldn't afford yeah, something Yeah, you didn't like have any this. money before the first album. I know, and actually, when I got this guitar, I still couldn't afford it. Yeah. It was a real unique situation. So the, sh the shortest version of the story is that my very first trip out to Los Angeles, I was doing a showcase kind of gig. And the big thing was I wanted to go to the um, go to the Guitar Center on yeah. Sunset because that's like the mecca. Sure. And I'd never been there. So I went in there. I went into the vintage room. Obviously, I went straight to the vintage room. And this guitar was like hanging right dead center in the middle of the wall there. And it just spoke to me. Yeah. And so I picked it up and I played it. And it was literally that aha moment. It was like it fit like a glove. Everything about it was right. I had been playing guitars at guitar shows, you know, all over the place. Yeah. Kind of searching for that. Yeah. mythical one guitar <laughs> yeah. that everything is perfect you know yeah. and i'd never found it i actually played some vintage strats i was really disappointed in and i was it was kind of baffling me you know i thought all vintage guitars sure. were supposed to look and sound great and play great but anyways this one everything about it was amazing and at that time i had to walk away from it because i couldn't buy it i couldn't afford it and it would took i mean it was like so difficult for me to walk away from that guitar so I think it was a year, maybe two years later, I came back and I was doing my first gig. I think it was the House of Blues on Sunset. Sure. Or maybe it was the Viper Room. I, I can't remember. But anyways, first thing I did was go to Guitar Center to see if the guitar was still there. And it was still there. That's shocking. I know. Yeah. And so I picked it up and I played it. I'm like, yes, this is it. I can't believe it's still here. So my dad was there. My A&R guy from the record company, Jeff Aldrich, was there. And my attorney, who's here uh, from Nashville, um, Jim Zumwalt, they were all there out for the show and they were like hey man we got to go do sound check and i'm like i'm not leaving without this guitar and my dad's like what and i'm like i'm not leaving this room without this guitar i left it once if i leave it again it's not going to be here the next time and he's like you can't afford that guitar i'm like i don't i'm not leaving here without so the three of them put their heads together and they agreed to split it uh amongst the three of them on their credit cards under the condition that I paid them back. Yeah. So that's how I got this guitar. They split the cost. And I think at the time, I can't remember, I want to say it was like 7,500 bucks. Yeah. Which, you know, nowadays a 61 Strat would oh. be, I don't know, at least three times that, yeah. right? Um, but they split it up, I paid them back, and it's been with me ever since. And it's lost a lot of paint since. Yeah, it, didn't, yeah, <laughs> it looked it didn't, way better. Yeah, it didn't look like this when I originally got it. You can find some old pictures of me when I first got it playing it. And, you know, there's barely anywhere like right here. This is all honest 
yeah. to goodness playing where yeah. um you know no trickery going on yeah. here and Hard people, mileage. a lot of people don't believe it because they say this just looks so unnatural but if you watch me play especially when i play rhythm yeah. i have a really broad stroke with yeah. my right hand and my pick i mean you can see the the scratch marks here where it's still i'm wearing it off but yeah, it's so you're... beautiful the way the layers of the grain have worn at different inter intervals and it's almost like water running over a rock and it just kind of smoothed it out, you know? It it's, is. It's pretty remarkable. That's I, I love it. the perfect simile, like water running over a rock, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, Fender built me, they built a replica. Which looks it, it's really pretty close. close. Um, and when they first made it, it looked even closer, but they couldn't duplicate this, at least not at the time. Maybe right. they have the ability to do it now because it's actually the wood grain yeah. that's worn out in, at different, you know, levels. So they kind of, you know wore this out and they stained this pattern on this guitar but you ate away and i ate away at that right <laughs> yeah. but you know they're really close and yeah. i mean obviously i can tell the difference if you put them side by side you can kind of tell the difference between the two um, but they really kind of got it and and when i travel and i can't bring this one and i play this one it really does kind of have the spirit of the original oh, really? it's like it feels like an extension of oh, of my great. original guitar so, so you don't even miss number one well i do miss it i just don't realize how much i miss it <laughs> until i get it back in my hands and i'm like oh, oh there it is you know yeah. It's so great. That's great. Yeah, that's the one. Okay, yeah. perfect. That is your number one. Yeah, uh, yeah. recently, you know, this is the thing. Like, you know, everybody, a lot of guys name their guitars. Yeah. And I've always had a difficult time naming uh, my guitars. It, uh, it takes a really long time, especially this one, which is why we always referred to it as the one or whatever. But uh, I actually settled on the name Martha because I feel like, you know, this is a, this is a strong lady right here you <laughs> yeah. know and the the name martha just sounds like a you know an old fashioned old school yeah. strong you know willed woman and yeah. i think that's what this one is so we call it martha now okay yeah fabulous well that one's not going anywhere no <laughs> i'll be buried with that one yeah um so yeah i don't know if we you just kind of want to go through yeah just pick the out, highlights yeah yeah pick out, sure yeah. they're all um, cool well yeah well there's so there's martha and i call the replica i call it Mar martha jr okay. right <laughs> and so good i mean this is always a good one we'll do this one kind of right out the gate um, yeah this is a recent acquisition uh been on my bucket list for a long time uh it's a 1960 les paul sunburst uh i'm sure you guys all know what that is yeah. um all original like everything is wow. original the only thing is i i replaced this because i was scared that i was going to lose the original one and you know they're hard to come by and then this this uh jack cover this jack plate right here uh the original one had a couple little cracks in it and I didn't want it to just get banged around so I took that off yeah everything else the frets I mean every <sighs> single thing's the original on it. Wow. Um, killer top I mean it's got all it this is like from the uh, the run I think in the mid 60s uh, they you know they were changing the color right, right. the red because to, they went to a different color red so that it wouldn't fade so much and then they changed the knobs and stuff like that um, but at, at a certain point like midway through the production cycle in 1960 I'm told uh, that they went, you know, and made a run of these guitars that basically has all, you know, the aesthetics of a 59 uh, Les Paul, but this still has the thinner neck. Oh. And for me, I prefer the thinner neck. I mean, uh, when I played a bunch of them before I got to this one and, you know, the 58s, 59s, just the chunkier neck, I feel like I play faster and it's a little more effortless with the thinner neck. And maybe that's because, you know, I've played so many 60s Stratocasters sure. and they're not necessarily known for the big chunky necks, yeah. you know? But it just feels good to me. And it's, this thing has all the looks and the personality. Like it sounds killer. Yeah. And uh, I, you know, I just, I couldn't believe it when I saw it and when I plugged it in and it checked all the right boxes and, and thankfully uh, the search was over. And I'm the kind of guy like, you know, I have some really good friends that you know can't stop at just one but i'm yeah. okay with stopping at just one like i yeah. feel like you know all right i can check that off the list yeah. i got you know it's kind of like the one and i don't really feel like i'm going to find another one just like it so i'm good with it what a relief right you can like yeah. just stop looking i know and it's you know it's one of the holy grails yeah. i mean it really is for all no, guitar it, players it is just for some people just to play one and i got i got to play a lot in in my search you know you meet these guys there's this community yeah. in the sunburst community and you meet these guys and the, the key players and 
and people are really generous. Like they'll be like, mm. like tonight, there's a guy bringing a '59 Sunburst out. He wants me to play it on stage. Yeah. It's like these guys have these guitars, and they want to see them yeah. played. You know, and they'll hook you up with the other guys, and they think maybe maybe this guy has the guitar you're looking for. And the search was really compelling. It was a really amazing experience, and I met so many great people along the way. And ultimately, like. To be honest with you, guitar is great and it sounds great. I've already used it in the studio and stuff. But the stories and, and the experience getting to the guitar, to me, is just as valuable, maybe even more so than the guitar. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, very cool. It was it was kind of big news to see you play in Les Falls because you've always been such a Strat guy. I have. And, you know, at the end of the day, when you're a guitar player, it's like you, you go for the sound. You go yeah. where the sound is. And sometimes if you want that sound you're only going to get it right here right and um i mean if you go back to my 2004 album the place you're in uh, i would say probably 60 percent of that record was a les paul huh. and that's a pretty rocking album yeah. uh but that was when my grandfather gave me a les paul that he had uh around that time and i started playing it and i used it on that record and then i took a les paul out on tour for that tour and then you know i really kind of started getting into the whole yeah. Gibson thing, you know, and I, yes, I'm a Strat guy, but at the end of the day, I you know, you don't want just like one screwdriver. You yeah, know? Right. It's like you come to my house, you look in my garage, I got all kinds of tools <laughs> and I got about five sets of the same different kinds of tools because you need different sizes for different applications and yeah. different sounds for different songs, you know? Yeah, it brings different things out of you. Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's that's a, that's a strong opener. Yeah. Those two. Well, those two, they, yeah. I mean, it's all downhill <laughs> yeah. from here, guys. Yeah. So, but we know that, you know, <laughs> you might tune out, so we're gonna get you from the top. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, but there's amps and stuff too, so you oh, yeah, we stick got, around. Well, that's right, we got some amazing <laughs> amplifiers, so you might wanna hang around. Yeah, for hold on. All right, so look, here, this one's a, this is a great one. Yeah, that's cool. I actually just saw, uh, I think it was Emerald City just sold one of these guitars. I don't know how much they sold it for, but I think, I gotta look at my number here. This is, uh, see, I thought I had 181. This is 151. They had 181. Hmm. Um, and so it's the Jimi Hendrix Monterey Pop uh, Strat that Fender did in the late 90s. Uh, this is all like hand painted. I think the lady's name was Pamelina, I believe, that did the artwork. I had the custom left-handed neck, so they had the reverse headstock vibe put on it. Cool. Um, so I have the original neck that I put away, but I had that one made for the guitar. And it's so funny how like, Random people be like, I didn't know you could play guitar left-handed. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's so weird. Um, but, you know, I started wearing this off. And, and so we put some tape on it to try and salvage that little, you know, sticker. It was kind of like a backstage pass thing that they put on the guitars when they were new. I mean, but, you know, I've really worn this guitar out. I mean, it's been banged up. I used to throw it on the ground and just do full-on Jimi Hendrix, you know, crazy stuff on stage and I still kind of get down yeah. with it um as most you the, should yeah well most of these you know collectors have these and and they've never been played right. uh and I think John Mayer has one actually he told me uh when I saw him at one of the shows I think I was out on the road with uh Aerosmith at the time but he told me that uh he saw me playing one of one of these and that's why he went and got one, oh really right and that's he good. plays his i play mine but just about everybody else mm -hmm. they just look at them because they're beautiful but they actually sound great too yeah. so we do Jimi hendrix songs and i'm usually playing this one and you did the whole hendrix tour thing too yeah 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 the experience hendrix thing i've been a part of that since before it was even a tour yeah uh it started as a birthday celebration um Actually, the first time we were celebrating Jimmy's father's birthday oh, really? in Seattle. And we did like a concert in a club. And then we did a, I think it was a, Hen a Jimmy birthday celebration like twice. Is that of the experience? Mm, well, that was at the EMP thing oh, yeah, the very EMP. first time. Yeah, yeah with, his, with Jimmy's dad when he was still here, yeah. Al. Um, but then after that, they had done it in a club. I can't remember what the name of the club was. And then at some point they thought, oh, well, let's see if we can turn this into a tour. Yeah. So I've been part of it since, you know, the very beginning. And it, then it's just morphed into this massive tour. Yeah, it's, with, a, yeah, it's a big, that's, that's become a big thing. Yeah, a lot, I mean, really great guitar players on that oh, thing. Oh, God. So this is, uh, this is my latest uh, Kenny Wayne Shepherd Signature Series Stratocaster. Love it. Um, and Love I use bound, this. So, okay, so what made you go for the bound fingerboard? Okay, so, <clears throat> I mean, obviously Eric Johnson had a signature. Maybe yeah. he's still that maybe they still sell that version with a uh, binding on the neck. Um, so then I started digging around because, you know, at, there was a small amount of guitars in the mid, mid to late 60s that Fender 
release that were strats with bound necks. Uh, yes. Brad Whitford from Aerosmith has a mint condition one. I oh, mean, really? it looks brand new. And it's, it's like Olympic white and has binding. It's just beautiful, right? And then that got me intrigued. So then I started trying to find one of those original guitars. And yeah. then I stumbled across a guitar that had a bound neck and had block inlays, right? And rumor has it that they also let a few of those out of the factory. You know, I guess they were trying out different things. And, you know, they had other guitars yeah. that had block inlays and bound necks, but not yeah. necessarily a Strat. Yeah, the Jaguar or the right. so, Jazzmaster, I think. I don't know. So then, you know, my goal with this guitar... Because I had a signature before this, and it was uh, it was a, Me a Mexican assembled Strat, right? So made in Mexico, and we had three different models. But the goal behind that was so that young people, it was the price point was in re within reach for young people. Yeah, they could like play guitar. They could, you know, not have to like sell an arm or a leg right. to buy the guitar, and that went really well. And but the specs on that guitar are almost completely different than this one. That one had a big thick baseball bat neck and a 12 inch kind of flat radius on it. Um, had medium jumbo frets on it. Uh, the pickups were different. Um, the body was older. So we changed it all up. So I went with an ash body uh, and it's chambered to oh. make it to lighten it up. I mean, it's a light guitar. You know, it's not, oh, yeah. not too bad for an ash body. Yeah, yeah, strap. no, not, not particularly heavy. And so that also makes it more resonant. But then we took a, a, a factory color and created a custom color out of it. So we took sonic blue and created translucent sonic blue. Oh, cool. But if you're going to make a trans color, then you have to be able to see the wood grain, right? right. Otherwise, it's kind of pointless. All the early strats were ash bodies for the most part. Um, so I wanted that look, that kind of 50s translucent Mary Kay kind of vibe. Um, but with this new color. Um, so we chambered the body, lightened it up. I did the Graftech saddles just like on my, all my other guitars. We came up with a new version of the Kenny Wayne Shepherd pickups that sound great. They're hotter, clearer, and louder, and quieter, right? Mm. Um, all kind of in, in, in a similar package. Um, we did a nine, uh, I'm sorry, seven and a quarter radius on this because oh, wow. I started thinking about it, I'm like, this is as close to a copy of my actual neck on my 61 Strat as they've ever created. And because to me, that's the ultimate neck on a Strat, just feels perfect. So, you know, I was like, if we're really gonna recreate that neck, it needs to be seven and a quarter. And also all of my custom shop Strats are seven and a quarter radius. So if people wanna play what I play, that's, it's gonna right. be seven and a quarter. Uh, we did 6,100 jumbo frets. And we did a matching headstock, and I went back to the original days of the Signature series and put my signature on the front of the guitar because when I was a kid and I saw Stevie Ray or Jeff Beck or Buddy Guy, Robert Cray, um, all those, Eric Clapton, those original Signature series guitars, yeah. all their signatures were on the front. And then eventually they started trying different things. The, my last one had it on the back of the headstock. Some guys do it on the, on the plate here. But I was like, no, man, we want to do a throwback to the original days of the uh, yeah. of the signature guitar. So we put it back on the front, block inlays, binding, and basically what the goal was is an, a really great sounding guitar, great playing guitar. But I wanted people to feel like they're getting a custom shop kind of experience. Yeah, sure. But it's an American-made Strat, so it doesn't necessarily have the custom shop price attached to it. Yeah. So it's a really compelling guitar. It sounds great, and I think it's absolutely beautiful. Yeah, it is. I yeah. love it. So it's been selling. They can't. They actually can't keep them in stock, um, which is a good problem to have. Oh yeah, that's great. Uh, okay, that's see. very cool. So far, all cool guitars. All right. Well, there's one behind you. This oh, one's good. this one's really cool. This one is a custom shop creation that I did with Todd Krause, and we we've done a couple of collaborations together. I kind of had this in my mind, and he helped it come to reality. And Billy Gibbons actually named this guitar. I don't even know if he knew he was naming it, <laughs> but I was playing here. Uh, we were inducting, I think it was Double Trouble into the Musicians Hall of Fame oh, in Nashville. Cool. And me and Billy and some other guys were playing. And, uh, and I had just gotten this guitar and I showed it to him because I knew he could appreciate it. And then the next day, uh, we showed up for sound check and he goes, did you bring Copper Boy with you? <laughs> and from that day forward, <laughs> this guitar has been called Copper Boy. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I just figured a lot of times on stage, we're all kind of wearing dark clothing and yeah. stuff and you know, we need some real eye candy and, and why not, why shouldn't it be the guitar? So, uh, amazing goal, uh, 
I think the base of it is gold sparkle and they, then they put this kind of tangerine orange on top of it to give it an orange sparkle matching headstock. Reverse headstock like my on my Monterey Strat, uh, left-handed Tremlo a la Hendrix, reverse bridge pickup a la Hendrix. Um, but these are regular, these aren't Dan Electros, these are regular single coil. Some of the last pickups that were wound by Abigail at the custom shop oh, before really? she retired. And they just have the metal covers oh, okay. over the top, which actually, to be honest with you, does affect the sound. They become a little microphonic, but they actually, it's, it gives it a slight kind of humbucker sound to huh. it, a humbucker quality to it, just because of that metal cover over the top. Um, you're not gonna fool anybody thinking you're playing a Les Paul, but it changes the nature of the sound of the guitar. It doesn't yeah, cool. sound like an, immediately like a Strat. Um, so this one's a, a fan favorite. People love to see this guitar on stage, and and it definitely has its own identity. Was it a bit of a, an adjustment with that with that left-handed wheelie no. bar? No, because uh, in my earliest days on my first album, Lead Better Heights. I use the Stevie Ray Vaughan signature oh, strap because right. you know, Which I mean, came that way. everybody yeah. knows uh, yeah. how big of an influence he was on me. Mm -hmm. And so I've been playing his signature model, you know, for a couple of years uh, before Fender started building me guitars. So I was used to that. And there's actually a huge benefit to that. If you can get used to, the only problem is, is it's a slight adjustment if you like to pick and use the bar like a Jeff Beck kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but, but it's not hard to get used to it. But what the real advantage to it is that if you're going to do like a dive bomb, you can go, you can hit that E and go all the way down to the body of the guitar and that string is still going to oh, be yeah. ringing, right? Where if it's here, your right, hand is going to hit it. it out, yeah. And so you can really, sonically, you can get some really cool sounds that you really can't get otherwise oh, without cool. having that there. And you can anchor your hand on the back of the guitar right there, just like it was made for it. Yeah. And it's really cool. Yeah, so, that is cool. Yeah, it's nice. So that's Copper Boy. Okay, love that. And then, I don't know, here's one more. Oh, well, there's two more. This one, this is the Crossroads Strats, another Todd Krause collaboration. Mm -hmm. Highway 49 and Highway 61. The idea, uh, you know, there's like a, a mythical, like a, a, a make-believe story about this guitar that, you know, a guy went to the crossroads, yeah. was gonna sell his soul to yeah. be famous and be a great guitar player, except he got gypped and it didn't work and he what couldn't play. What makes you think it's uh, not real? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? So, he, so the guy tosses the guitar in a ditch and leaves it and it just like, you know, is like abandoned and, and it kind of looks like a reject kind of instrument, but yeah. it's great and it sounds killer and you know, just, but this is kind of a nod to my love for blues music and yeah, my musical great. roots and stuff. And a guy sent, made this for me and, oh, that's and sent great. that. It's the only guitar that I keep one of these on actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's visually, it's just a stunning guitar and it plays great, sounds great. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and then probably, you know, the last one that we have time for is this one now. I had a conversation with the guys at Fender about doing reclaimed wood guitars. This was years ago. And they, they, they were open to it, and, but they said, you know, the, the real issue is getting your hands on the material and the cost of the material, sure. you know? And- Yeah, hard to source that. Yeah. You'd think it'd be easy, but it's not. Exactly, yeah. and it's expensive, and you know, it's a limited supply, and so anyways, I had this conversation with them about it, and it kind of seemed like, you know, they had already decided that it wasn't possible, but it was like not very long after that that they introduced the reclaimed wood uh, Strat, and I think they did. I think there was two versions of a Strat, and maybe a Telecaster, but this one is uh, was built from a barn oh. in Michigan, in northern Michigan, that was disassembled. The barn was constructed in the 18, late 1800s, wow. and this is pine. Oh wow! And it's super light, and instead of like painting it and putting like a clear coat on it, they just did an oil rub finish on it. And so it just really rings. And it's like, you know, this is wood from the, well, before the 18, late 1800s, because right. it was grown before they built the, the, the barn. And uh, it's fully, you know, resonant, dried out, cured, yeah, it's everything. It's not gonna get any drier I know. than that. And yeah. it just sounds amazing. And so I was so excited when I found out that they actually made some of these guitars, so I got one. And what's cool is like, this thing was brand new and within literally like, less than like one tour, this thing started looking like my 61 Strat. Right. Because that, uh, that oil-based finish just, it doesn't take much effort to get it to come off. And yeah. so now it's actually wearing just in the same pattern as my 61 Strat. It's that sledgehammer right hand, man. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so I was actually, I started to document it a little bit on my social media in the very beginning when I got the guitar and I saw that it was wearing so quickly yeah. to say, hey, watch the evolution of this guitar <laughs> and how long it takes it to start looking like the 61. Uh, so we call this one Woody. All right, yeah. perfect. Perfect. Well, okay. Amazing guitars. I think we had to plug some in and see what those amps and pedals and such look like. Yeah. All right. So here we are. Pedal board amps kind of mm -hmm. take us through the whole enchilada. Yeah. I'll run you. I'll just do a quick run through the signal chain. So sure. first off, we have the Vox Wah pedal. I think this is a newer one, uh, but inside the guts, it's this guy that custom made it and he made an actual Clyde McCoy circuit with like the tropical fish caps and all that oh, stuff. Oh, really? And the halo inductor. Uh, really cool. So it sounds deep totally nerd. Legit. Deep nerd. Oh yeah, stuff. this guy's yeah. legit, man. He's <laughs> legit. Uh, I can't think of his name right now, but I'll get it to you because you, you guys, know, you definitely. Somebody in the comments. What's his name? Venus. 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 Okay. There we go. That's a good. All right, good. So here you go. Yeah, my guy. So the Venus Wichwa is like you know, if you can't get your hands on a real Clyde McCoy, yeah. this is the closest thing you're gonna get. I have two originals and they sound incredible, but out on the road, this thing, you wouldn't know the difference. Yeah. Um, and you've always been a, a quarter inch cable guy, never. Yeah, no, I've done some wireless, right? Uh, like I've done some wireless rigs, but you know, I found that it compresses the signal. Yeah. I mean, it's great when you want to like. some people like, yeah. Well, for me, I, I want it to sound as real and analog and connected as possible. Sure. And so, you know, mentally I had a hard time getting beyond the whole wireless thing. Yeah. But it's, you know, when you open up for the Rolling Stones, it's great to be able to run. They have such a big stage. It's yeah. great to be able to run over there and play for those people. Right. Because I did it the first time I played with them, and I had, a, like, I don't know, a 30-foot guitar cable, and I <laughs> ran that way, and my guitar cable came flying out of my guitar in front of 80,000 people. <laughs> right. So that's after that is when I started using a wireless. Yeah, yeah, right. But I kind of brought, worked my way back towards just using cables all the time. Um, so, yeah, we got the Vox. Well, the next thing in the line is probably the Octavia. Um, so we got the Octavia, that's a Roger Mayer spaceship Octavia. That is the sound uh, for Blue on Black. That's yeah, the guitar solo go. for Blue on Black. Uh, then the Analog Man, King of Tone, which to me is like the most, you know, that's the go-to overdrive. If I'm gonna go sit in with somebody, I think I need a pedal. If I'm gonna do anything, I've got that pedal with me. Yeah. And what's cool is it's got two channels. You can set it independently. One's a high gain, one's a lower gain. Uh, it's pretty transparent, but it's got everything you need. And if you're in a really bad situation and your amp's really not cutting it, then you can just stack those on top of each other yeah. and get as much you know, sustain and drive out of the pedal as you'll probably ever need. Sure. Uh, so it's a good cheat for that kind of stuff. Um, then we're gonna have the, uh, well actually from the, from the WAH, we probably went into the Univibe because Univibe signal is always best at the very beginning of the signal chain. So this Univibe, actually my guitar tech, Dustin, makes these. This is called the Sir Henry. And I'm gonna, when I say painstakingly recreating Univibes, oh, yeah. this guy takes it to another level. We were actually, before you arrived, we were talking about the whole thing. And yeah, yeah that, is, that so, is deep nerd. It, it is. <laughs> and I mean, he's like having parts manufactured like that don't exist right now <laughs> to try and get the actual correct sound, you yeah. know, because it's really hard to do. And I have some originals. I have one that allegedly was owned by Hendrix and they're, they're delicate things you know right. they can break really easily this thing has been road tested no, it's great. and it has the sound so you want a univibe that's going to hold up and you don't have to worry about like thousands and thousands of dollars you know uh getting banged around on the road this is the way to the go sir henry yeah right. sir henry um then we've got the analog man by chorus it's kind of like the king of tone in a chorus pedal so it has two independent uh channels basically and you can i use it for like a leslie sound so yeah. i'll have a, a high speed and a slow speed um and i really only use certain like most of these pedals only get used on like one or two songs sure specifically yeah pretty much your tone is yeah it's guitar and it's, amp yeah and then guitar and amp and king of tone yeah um so the chorus is there for like one or two songs, but it's a great sounding unit. And especially if you don't want to carry around like one of those vibratones or something like yeah. that, Leslie speaker. Then we have free the tone delay pedal. The cool thing about this is, is it looks really confusing. Yeah. It's kind of overwhelming, yeah. but you can program it. 
and you can get it exact. You can really go down the rabbit hole. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I get overwhelmed and have to walk away from it, come right. back to it. But I have gotten some really great delay sounds. And again, I'm not a guy that you won't hear delay on my guitar rig all the time. It's yeah. like on one or two songs. Yeah, it's like I don't even hear verb on your guitar yeah. rig a lot. Well, you it's know, that's right. Pretty and dry. So I had to actually, because of the amps that Dumble's been had been making for me, uh, none of them had reverb in yeah. them. And so I ended up getting the Free the Tone reverb pedal okay. in case I want to do like a really back alley blues thing and yeah, I yeah. need that reverb sound yeah. and then I'll kick that thing on. Um, and so otherwise, uh, oh, and I have the uh, the Klon. So this is the Gen 2 Klon. It's the Klon reissue in the smaller housing. I have an original, I have like one of the earliest made uh, original Klons. I think it's like serial number 31 or 33. Wow. Um, but obviously that one's at home and this one sounds great. Um, so that kind of rotates between a TS-808 or the Klon. But that's it. Then we have this uh, radial thing, and this is basically just splitting out to the three different amps that we have back there, and you know, with very minimal signal loss. And that's it. I mean, that's that's the deal. We have the Voodoo Lab switching system, and that's just so I'm not tap dancing all the time. Sure. So there's no like really like crazy trickery going on. It's just like here's my blue on black rhythm sound, so that kicks on the Univibe for me, and then I want to hit the solo and it automatically turns on the Octavia and the delay that's preset oh, for the tempo great. for the song. I mean, you know what a switching system is. And yeah. It just kind of makes your life a little bit easier. Yeah, and keeps that signal a little more pure, and right. yeah, that's great. And okay, so amp-wise. So this is a slightly different setup than I've been running, but these are all Dumble amplifiers. Um, you know, before he passed away, he and I became very close. He built me 11 amplifiers over the course of our friendship. Wow. And uh, this is three of them. And what I really liked about it is that, you know, these are like, I, I'm, a, I'm a car guy, and in the hot rod world, we have what you call a sleeper, which is like, you know, it looks like your grandmother's car, but under the hood, you've got like 800 horsepower, and you'll sure. burn the tires off of it. Well, that's what they, these are. They look like your, you know, average run-of-the-mill vintage Fender amplifiers, but under the hood, that is 100% Dumble. He would take these amps, he basically used the cabinet and the chassis, and then everything else was taken out. Transformers, um, you know, the circuit, everything. He would hand wire all that stuff from scratch. So, wow. you know, they're just kind of in appearance fender, but inside under the hood, it's 100% Dumble. So the Pro Reverb, originally that was a combo. I had it converted to a head cabinet um, so I could do the two closed back, uh, the closed back cabinet with the two 12s. And that thing is one of maybe a handful or less amps that he built in that configuration where in one side of the amp, one channel, he has what he calls his ultraphonic circuit. And in the other channel, he has what he calls the rock phonic circuit, which just has more of everything and a lot more gain on tap and a lot more sustain. And I don't think he made five amplifiers in that configuration wow. in his entire life. So it's monstrous. That thing sounds incredible. And he made it so that I could take that to Europe. So it has a switchable transformer, so I can take it over to Europe, really? open it up inside, switch it, and then it converts over and it can run on 220. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Thought of everything. Yeah, exactly. So the, the one in the middle, that's a, uh, originally was a basement reissue. So again, you know, those original, those LTD basements, they were like a, a printed circuit board, yeah. right? So he, I mean, I watched him. He took it out, tossed that in the trash, and, you know, had his own board you know, pressed all the holes and the eyelets and everything for the board and wired it all up. And it's just absolutely beautiful inside. But that is called the slide winder. And again, that's another one that I believe maybe he only made definitely less than 10 of those probably in his life. Huh. And it's just absolutely sounds incredible. It has everything, it has all the growl that you could ever want out of like a tweed basement style kind of amplifier. And the next one over there is a Blackface Bandmaster. So that's a 67, original 67 Bandmaster that he gutted and he did for this one. I usually run a Ultraphonics Bandmaster. It's a 65 that he did, but that one is at home right now. This is what he called the AC763 circuit. So essentially this, from the way he explained it to me is, this is what would, would have been what he envisioned the next like lineage of the AB763 circuit that Leo Fender had created, this is, would be the AC763. So it's like, if you just compare it to its original, or, or to the other version of it, or its original you know, circuit, then it would, it would sound like the difference between listening to something 
in like mono versus like high fidelity surround sound. It, it's the fidelity that comes out of the amplifier is absolutely incredible, especially when you AB it with what the original actually sounds like. And are you really running it on 10? Yeah. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, they put 10 on there because <laughs> yeah. they want you to use it, right? Yeah, yeah, right. So, uh, yeah. yeah we run it through all, all the full range. And yeah. what's incredible about his amps is like, one of the first things I noticed is the range, you know, some amps like you can get and you turn the knob and maybe from between one and five on, on the dial is like very little difference. Right, right. And, but on his man, it is unbelievable. Every notch on that dial does something oh, noticeable. So there's nuance oh, every step. Unbelievable. Oh. I mean, the amount of low end that you can get out of these amps mm -hmm. is like nothing I had ever heard out of a, any Fender amplifier. Yeah, in fact, I see you've got the bass like rolled all the That's way right, down. That's right, because it's like, it's too much. God. Like, well, it's not too much. It probably would be just enough for somebody. Yeah. But for me, it's like, yeah. it's more bass than I would ever know what to do with. But I just admired him so much for like make, and I told him, I'm like, it's incredible because every knob, you have 100% use of, of the full spectrum of what's available there. And it never seemed like that was possible before. And right. he was really proud of that. So what, what was the process like? Would you just say, hey, I want something like this? No. And you'd, or he would just tell you, I'm making you something like this? No, no, no. So, uh, well, yeah, I would say, hey, I kind of like, this is what I'm thinking we need, you know, I need, or the sound that I need. Every amp he built for me was a different circuit, yeah. and everyone ha has a different sound. Oh. So everyone serves a different purpose, which is great. So there yeah. was no duplicates, right? We weren't like repeating ourselves. Right. But I would go to his house and he would, I mean, you, if you went to his house, it was always a minimum. And this was for everybody, I think. It was like a minimum four hour visit. Like serious. And it, you didn't really want to leave. Yeah. Because you walk in the door and you're surrounded by the most amazing gear, right? right. Guitars, amplifiers, like the best of the best. Yeah. And he would sit me down in his living room and we're surrounded by amps and he'd hand me, I'd bring a guitar or he'd hand me, he had two guitars that he frequently used to test amps and stuff. And he'd plug me in to these different amplifiers and different circuits and I would just play and he would just sit there and listen to me. And basically what he was doing is he was listening to the way I play, my attack, my feel and what it is that I'm trying to get the amplifier to do. Right. Then he would see which circuits are responding well to my touch. And then he would go, okay, this is, this is the path we need to go down. And I know what you're trying to get out of it. So I'm going to go, I'm going to take this as the foundation. And then I'm going to go tune it to your hands to make it do exactly what you want it to do. Because I know what you're trying to get out of it. Right. Like he knew what I was trying to get out of it. And what was amazing is like, the first amp he handed over to me and I played through it, it was like a, a veil, a curtain had been lifted. And because it opened up the, this level of creativity in me because before I was using so many tricks yeah. to try and just get some, certain things out of the amplifier and the guitar, right? right? And so a lot of my focus would be on that. In that moment, it's like what combination of things I have to do just to hope that I can get this sound out of here in this moment. And instead, it would just happen effortlessly. And that freed up so much creativity for me. Oh, yeah. Because then I'm not focused on that. I'm focused more on just the music, just playing the music. And that's yeah. really like, you know, I think that was his goal was to give people the tools to enable them to like, to, to reach higher elevation, you know, of playing and, and ability. And it really did that for me, for sure. Wow. Yeah, yeah it's amazing. Nobody will get that that experience again because he would make those amps specifically for the players right and now if somebody somebody can still buy a dumble but it's not made for them yeah i think that's you know part of and i can't speak for him personally but i mean i talked to him about a lot of this stuff and i think that's one of the things that you know that was frustrating for him was that he would build an amplifier it's like a tailor-made suit yeah. right like you know you yeah. could go and have a suit tailored just for you, and then I can put it on, it's not gonna fit me yeah, right, you right. know, because we have different builds. Yeah. And it was the same thing with his amplifiers, and that amp was built with that guy in mind, and that yeah. was supposed to be played by that person. Yeah. And so, and he put a lot of effort into making it appropriate for that player. Right. And then, all, you know, then it I gets bet it could, Yeah, then somebody would like flip it. Yeah, <laughs> so so there you go, yeah. you know, and, and, and then, you know, the, the entire, industry that was launched you know right. off of his you know designs and things like that because he was so exclusive and so hard to track down 
And, you know, he picked and chose what he did. Right. And so many people wanted what he, what he had to offer that other guys stepped in to try and fill the void. And, yeah. you know, that was frustrating for him, too. But, um, you, but must, yeah. you must hate back line. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, yeah. Well, so I had him build me a head specifically that would weigh less than 50 pounds oh. when in a road case. Yeah. So that was you another thing. I'm, all, like, right. I'm like, hey, man, here's the thing. We got my sound. But now I need to be able to take my sound on an airplane, <laughs> right. right? I need to check it if possible, yeah. if I have to, and so I can have my sound with me, but it's yeah. got to be less than 50 pounds right. in the road case. You and Robin Ford. Yeah. Well, you guys are flying with your doubles. Yeah. yeah. So I try not to do that so much anymore, but especially now because they're so irreplaceable. Yeah. 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 That's great. Well, hey, man, I know you've got the show and sound check, so but I really appreciate you coming and talking to yeah, us. Yeah, it's my pleasure, man. Thanks this whole rig. Hey, yeah. man. Congrats. Good to see you. Till next time.